Toxic stands tall among the history of 21st century pop, an actually brilliant, weird piece of art. Can't say that about many hits, can you? Most of them are just... This is the song I made. This is the song I made. Now, I know what you're all thinking. What interest could I, a man, possibly have in the music of Britney Spears? To which I say, oh, get your minds out of the gutter. I just like her songs, some of them. No, when I want to do that, I turn elsewhere. These holes are one inch in diameter. For all its brashness, the entertainment business is timid and risk averse. So it's a treat when they accidentally allow something great to happen. And now, here's the story of one such time. Born in an unsung backwater called the United States of America, Britney Spears briefly held the record for world's youngest person, setting the tone for what would become a lifetime of achievement. She said she knew what she wanted to do from an early age, starting dance lessons at age three, making her stage debut at five, and at 11 being cast in the Mickey Mouse Club as part of a bumper intake that also included Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake, Kerry Russell and Ryan Gosling. In these clips, she can be heard singing in her natural voice. And they show that while later her vocals are often obscured by processing in the studio and by pre-recorded tracks live, her success was built on more than image propped up by auto-tune. In 1997, she signed to Jive Records and was assigned producer Eric Foster White, who spent a month shaping her voice into the breathy affectation she'd be required to adopt thereafter. In 1999, her first album debuted at number one in the Billboard Hot 100. Get to know the new girl in school and her first 11 songs, Britney Spears. While it's hard in light of subsequent events not to view Spears as a naive talent sexualized and exploited by the music industry, she's always resented this implication. How does somebody go from being a celebrated entertainer to being a victim of that success? Oh, see, I don't like that. A victim of that success. The provocative schoolgirl outfit she wore in her first video was her own idea, as was this little number. At the 2003 VMA, she performed Like a Virgin with Christina Aguilera and Madonna, where famously this happened. Blowing the tiny minds of everyone who hadn't seen Nirvana do the exact same thing ten years earlier. Honestly, when some sweaty blokes do it, it's offensive and cut from repeat broadcast. Get three hot lasses to do it, it's all anyone wants to talk about. Maybe if the lads had worn suspenders and shaken their tushies a bit, it would have been different. So, 2003, fourth album sessions, increased creative control, blandishments, blandishments, blandishments. Sorry, that's autocorrect. That should have been blah, blah, blah. The number of personnel involved in making a modern pop album never fails to amaze. The credits of Spears' fourth album, In The Zone, list 98 separate people, plus however many are in the Stockholm strings. One of those people is this guy. Kathy Dennis was a successful solo artist during the early 90s and felt out of place, later saying, I love pop music, but instinctively I'm darker than that. She quit performing to focus on songwriting and luckily had a great in through her manager Simon Fuller who was in charge of the Spice Girls and later S Club 7. She specialised in top line and lyrics and by 2003 having already scored 12 hits including this she flew to Sweden for a seven day writing session with producers Bloodshy and Avant. The intention was to write some material for Janet Jackson, but things didn't go according to plan. On day one, they presented Dennis with a strange up-tempo track with disorienting chord changes and a hair-raising string sample. Bloodshy, a.k.a. Christian Carlson, later described its creation. He was playing around with snippets of Bollywood film soundtracks, but was nagged by one in particular, thinking, it's kind of annoying, but there's something brilliant about it. He worried it would be impossible to turn into a song, but added acoustic guitar and kept chipping away, saying it was piece by piece. It was all about trying to make that freaking string thing work in a song. That string thing was a combination of two pieces from the soundtrack of a movie whose name looks like this written down and translates to made for each other. The 
combination of the two was striking enough, with the melodic part starting on a high note discordant to the song's key of C. But they also made it work for them three different ways, using a partly reversed variation in verse 2, and then using it over some quick changes in the chorus that pulled the harmony around. What's interesting listening to the instrumental is how basic it is. Some of the sounds are quite bad. The acoustic guitar has a muffled chorus tone to it. And there are blasts of de-eyed electric guitar that sound like the kind of thing you'd expect from an untalented bedroom producer. None of which stood in the way of a classic being born. Hearing all this at the session, Dennis started strong, saying, I hear so many different melodies I can't commit, so I laid down about 50 or 60. These ideas were whittled down to the final tune, and this was when her problems began. She said trying to write the lyrics was sheer torture. I beat myself up for seven days straight, not sleeping, trying to fit words to the right number of syllables. She kept tinkering until the last possible moment, only recording her demo vocals on the final day. Baby, can't you see? I'm calling a guy like you. She didn't leave happy, saying, I couldn't stop criticising. I have a tendency to be quirky and I've had to tone that down over the years. I just thought it was too odd, too complicated. It's thought that Dennis wrote Toxic about her then recent relationship with Noel Fitzpatrick, aka the super vet, aka this guy. If I was out to dinner with you, you know, and there was a dog in trouble, I would choose that dog over you. I will no wonder you're single. Exactly. (laughs) That's not Toxic though. That's just a man who puts romance second to getting elbow deep in the guts of a shattered dog. He knows where his priorities lie, and while they might not be the ones you'd pick, you have to respect the man's honesty. A fourth writer is listed on the track as well, international man of mystery Henrique Jombach, who has no social media presence and appears never to have conducted a single interview, leaving me no recourse but to speculate wildly as to the true nature of his contribution. After rejecting several theories, I concluded the most likely scenario is that he travelled back in time to invent the violin thus paving the way for the creation of the iconic sample. That would certainly explain why the sample's actual composers, Indian duo Lakshmi Kant Piarilal, aren't credited. Although, on balance, I concede that my theory answers far, far fewer questions than it raises. Following the session, Carlson flew to London to meet with Janet Jackson, who rejected the song. So, the producers sent it to Kylie Minogue's team. They also had a writing session with Britney Spears coming up, But they said, we didn't have Britney in mind for Toxic. It wasn't like her stuff at all. When that session came around, it was only at the very end that they mentioned this one other song they had in a drawer, warning that it was quite disturbed. After they played it, there was silence. But after conferring in another room with her team, Spears came back in and said they wanted it. Dennis later met with her to coach her through the vocal, and her unedited, uncorrected take has been leaked online. It is quite bad in places. Best of the moments where she slips into her real voice and you can hear the singer she truly is. Many of Dennis's guide vocals remain on the track and it's not clear whether Spears features on the chorus at all. The track also had further string overdubs and some surf guitar which gave it a spy movie, James Bond kind of feel. Spears's A&R thought the track far too strange for a single and the producers were left unsure whether it would even make the album. Eventually Minogue's team did get in touch to say they wanted the song but by then they were told they were too late. Dennis's input turned an instrumental that was all choppy, impish potential into a classic. Her vocal lines, rather than trying to create a relatable entry point, instead complete the strangeness of the backing track. She spends much of the chorus on notes that clash, but the melodies are so expressive in themselves that it works, and the result is a kind of dramatic, twisted catchiness. Her time spent trying to fit words to her own bizarre melodic shapes pays off in lyrics that both scan perfectly and are given life by those shapes. The words in turn give the famous sample its own character in the song, sounding like a taunting, gleeful commentary on the singer's predicament. Over me. 
and in the choruses seems to revel in her collision with something corrupt. There's a dialogue happening, almost like her own song is taking the piss out of her, and all this adds up to make a sour, warped masterpiece. But with all that said, do we not think they should have done the song as a piano jazz instrumental in 7-8 time? No, no, seriously, hear me out. That would have been a hit in the clubs. Nice. Spears' fourth album, In The Zone, was released in November 2003, and her commercial standing in America at the time is summarised by the fact that its first single, Me Against The Music, a duet with Madonna, no less, released just a couple of months after their famous Western Civilization upending kiss, peaked at a desultory number 35. But in a fascinating reminder of how iTunes used to be a thing, the album came out on that platform and her label were surprised to find people downloading that weird toxic track in huge numbers. A single release was arranged, she did a video where she garnished her modesty with diamonds and this is how she found herself with her first American top 10 for over three years almost by accident. Seeing this, the music industry realised the error of its ways en masse and began fearlessly promoting cool and interesting music from here on after. There's very little out there regarding Spears' feelings about the song, as she tends to get primarily asked about fame, boys and clothes. But at the time she said, I really like Toxic, it's really different. And in 2020, she named it as her favourite song she's ever done. In 2005, it won her only Grammy to date and also soundtrack track The End of the World on Doctor Who. To this day, it features on pretty much every best songs of the 2000s list. Just to get briefly personal, I was surprised when I realised that Spears is my age. When Baby One More Time came out, I was in school, and at that age you assume people on the radio are more grown up than you. But the fact is, that psychologically precarious, fractured state of development I had to face GCSEs with is roughly the same one she had to face worldwide fame with. That's a scary enough thought by itself, but add in the predatory, judgmental way the industry treats young women, and it's amazing she survived it. She certainly didn't survive unscathed. On the road to much worse events, Spears got creeped on by Neil Strauss for a chapter in his infamous handbook for stunted rape men. And the text is a grim window into the kind of mentality women in her position have increased exposure to. Unfortunately these days, when you Google Britney Spears toxic, results about the song are only about 50% of what turn up, thanks to the terrible behaviour of her own family, who famously used her 2008 breakdown as an excuse to take her rights away and start spending her money, using her understandable consequent distress as proof that she was damaged and needed their protection. Not so damaged though that she couldn't be drugged and sent out on a gruelling work schedule. Her father, Jamie Spears, gained legal powers over every aspect of her life, including her reproductive autonomy. But, viewed from the family's perspective, it was probably quite a heartwarming story. The gladdening tale of the sudden access to millions of dollars. Sadly, though, it was an all-too-brief decade before their meanie daughter ruined everything by selfishly requesting the return of her dignity. Honestly, some people in this world can only think of themselves, eh, Jamie, mate? So, is it weird that we live in a world that went crazy for a skimpily-dressed teenager who was required to put on a sexualised little girl voice for us? Yeah, it is. It implies all kinds of f up things that don't really need implying most of the time, not when the vivid manifestations are right out in the open for all to see. Frankly, it's best not to think about it too much. Just try to enjoy those catchy tunes, yo. And so that concludes this week's Trivialities. Is Toxic one of the greatest songs ever or am I just a big knobhead for daring to suggest such a thing? Fight it out in the comments like the rabid dogs you are. And before you go, subscribe button, related video, other video. And remember, you may think the ground is your friend and the sky your enemy, but time is your god and you must beg its forgiveness. <laughs>